We'll also try and manage that in our end, Melissa, and also, we'll also put ourselves on mute. Great, no problem. Thanks so much, guys, and, and thank you so much for this opportunity. It really is um, wonderful to have this kind of platform where I can tell the world about Secretary Birds and people can join me from all over the place. So um, really kudos to the two of you for launching these Better Birding webinars, and I hope to see more of the BirdLife team joining in future. Um, so that's just a, a bit of background on me. Um, thanks for the intro there, Dave. Um, I'm currently filling two positions at BirdLife South Africa. I'm the acting program manager for our terrestrial bird conservation program, but I, in my full-time capacity, am the, the raptors and large terrestrial birds project manager. So secretary birds fall very much within my mandate, and uh, I have to say I'm a little biased. They are certainly one of my absolutely favorite birds when it comes to South Africa's amazingly diverse bird life. And uh, yeah, hopefully by the end of tonight, you'll all have learned a little bit more about these charismatic raptors. Now, secretary birds are arguably the supermodels of the birding world. I mean, just look at those long legs and that beautiful hairdo on top of their heads. <laughs> they are wonderfully beautiful birds and I'm yet to meet someone who says they don't like seeing secretary birds. Um, National Geographic chose them to be the cover model of their Year of the Bird, which they ran last year in 2018, and Roberts followed suit, putting them on the cover of their field guide, which they recently published. So these birds really are donning the covers of all sorts of things, but something not many people realize is that it is not the national bird, the blue crane, that sits atop our crest. It is, in fact, the secretary bird that sits on top of South Africa's national emblem. So these really are incredible um, birds and very loved by South Africans. And as BirdLife South Africa, we feel really um, strongly about making sure that we can serve them. Now this year, we gave the Secretary Bird the illustrious title of Bird of the Year. Bird of the Year started back in 2007 um, with the African penguin, and we've had a whole host of species since then, including the barn swallow, white-winged flufftail, and Last year was the African Black Oyster Catcher's turn. And um, we were really happy to see the title coming back to the terrestrial space. And um, the Secretary Bird has had a wonderful year this year um, with lots of education material put out and some really interesting um, articles put in African Bird Life and um, popular media as well. So in terms of secretary birds, we all know that they are famous for killing snakes. And you can see in the bottom two pictures there, they are very good at it. That one in the middle there is taking on a puff out of other looks of things. Um, herpetologists feel free to correct my snake ID. But if you have a look up in the top left-hand side of your screen, you'll see a ninja chop going after a locust of some kind. Now, locusts actually, and the arthropods, make up around 87% of the secretary bird's diet. Um, so snakes only actually make up around 1% of, of secretary birds' diets. So that's something that not many, many people realize. These birds actually rely heavily on insect outbreaks. And then the appearance of these different locust swarms and grasshoppers turning up all over the place. But they are very much generalists, and they will take anything they can. Uh, they'll go for scrub hairs, as you can see in the top middle there. Um, lizards, as well as even frogs. And they will take pretty much anything they can catch and kick. When they kick prey, they deliver a force that is up to five times their own body weight. They weigh around four kilograms. And they deliver that kick with absolutely pinpoint accuracy. So they're able to take on all sorts of critters and take them out very quickly with a, a very hard blow. In terms of their habitat, these are open grassland birds. They like open space, they need space to walk, they need space to move. Um, and you can see there on the map that they occur pretty much across most of sub-Saharan Africa. Wherever there is open grassland or open savanna where we have a lot of um, less dense canopy cover, you have the opportunity to potentially find a secretary bird in those spaces. You can see that big hole in the middle of Africa is our rainforests. They do not like forests, so obviously we won't be finding them there, and they don't like deserts. So as long as it's a, a fairly productive system, you have a very good chance of seeing a secretary bird in these open landscapes. Now, unfortunately, these open landscapes, particularly across Africa, are disappearing. And if you have a look at that bottom left-hand picture, it is largely due to human expansion, um, linked to agriculture, linked to forestry, linked to just human um, settlements, 
we are taking over a lot of our open habitats and it's because it's easy to colonize these very open spaces. And so with this expansion of our activities, birds like the secretary bird that rely on these open habitats are starting to disappear. They also face a number of other threats linked to um, some of our human related activities. The power line, as you can see at the top there, um, is a huge problem for our secretary birds. During the tracking study, I've just got Bling's name up there, but we've actually lost um, four confirmed individuals of the 13 birds that we've been tracking to power line collisions. It is a big problem for these birds, and we are working very closely with ESCOM to make sure that we can put flight diverters and mitigation measures onto these power lines to try and stop these birds from colliding. Another impact for these birds is another type of linear infrastructure, and that is our fence lines. As you can see, sadly, that is one of our birds that unfortunately met its end when it um, collided with a barbed wire fence. Their legs get hooked in and these birds have a horrible, painful um, dehydration and starvation on their way down um, to their ultimate end. And it really is a horrific scene to come across and sadly we see it all too often. They're also exposed to um, pesticides. As you can see, that bird taking on, on a mouse. But when these crop sprayers fly over, they often, um, they will often pick up these um, poisoned insects or rodents and then ingest the poison themselves, which can lead to them being poisoned as well. So it really is, is a, a dangerous world out there for our birds. And in response to a lot of these threats, we are starting to see a massive decline in our secretary birds. Now what you're seeing on the screen at the moment is a map comparing the two Atlas projects which have been held in South Africa. The first Atlas project, which is where people go out and measure the presence of birds, um, took place between 1987 to 1991. And that you can see up in the top there um, was led by Harrison. And in uh, 2007 until um, present, we have SABAP2, so the Southern African Bird Atlas Project. And what they're able to do is go into uh, different parts of South Africa, which they've broken up into little squares. In the first Atlas project, they were doing it at a quarter degree um, square level. So those of you who are familiar with your latitudes and longitudes will know what a quarter degree square is. In the more recent um, iteration during SABAP2, they've refined this down to nine by nine kilometer um, pentads. So that's a five by five minute uh, latitudinal um, bracket. And by comparing the presence of secretary birds in these different regions, we can start seeing what's going on with our population from the 1980s through to the present. And sadly, it really isn't a very good um, scene. This is based on some of the work that Sally Hoffner did. Um, she published a wonderful study in 2014. And you can see that if we look at the amount of red squares, where we are seeing absence of secretary birds being detected in the second project compared to the first, and a lower reporting rate in between the first and the second um, pentads, we're looking at around a 75% decline nationally, which is very, very concerning. Now, obviously, citizen science data does come with some caveats, but in terms of the trends that we're observing, this is holding across the board. And I'll show you some more information in a little bit um, speaking to that as well. Now I mentioned that secretary birds love these wide open spaces. This is the ideal habitat for a secretary bird. These are the high altitude grasslands of the Eastern Free State. This is really Mecca in terms of secretary birds. These are very productive grasslands. There's lots of prey, nice open spaces. And a quick ecology lesson for those of you who don't know about biomes. These are the biomes of South Africa. So you can see the big green blob in the center of Eastern South Africa. That is our grassland biome. So all a biome is, is an area delineated by the dominant vegetation type that we find there. Now, as I said, secretary birds love grasslands. The sort of orangey color, the Namakuru to the, the west of our grassland biome is a more arid um, open habitat. Secretary birds are able to live in the Namakuru as well. And then of course that big yellow swathe around much of North and Eastern South Africa is our savanna biome where I'm sure many of you have observed secretary birds in the past. Now, if we have a look at one of the more fun things we did this year with Bird of the Year, we paired up with the app Bird Lasso. We have a great working relationship with Hank Nell and his team. And Hank has allowed us to start a Bird of the Year challenge. Now, what we've been able to do with this challenge is get people to register for the challenge on the app. 
And every time they see a secretary bird, they've been able to feed that data through to us via the app. And so since the beginning of the year, we are currently sitting at 733 records. And this has been contributed to us by just over 110 observers. And there's been around 125 people registered for this challenge. And you can see we've got an amazing coverage of secretary birds all over South Africa. And there really is this crux area around that central free state grassland region, as I mentioned earlier. Now, something that's very, very concerning for us is if we start looking at the habitat change across South Africa, we'll start seeing a bit of a, a bleak picture. Now, I've left that oval there where our key areas were. What you're seeing on this picture is I've essentially taken our land cover map. So that tells us what's going on on the ground. Is it human settlement? Is it mining? Is it agriculture? Is it a natural space? So we've taken all of the areas that are still natural, they are colored in charcoal. So anywhere that's dark is still in a relatively natural state. Anything that is in pale or peach is something linked either to human in the peach or very, very arid desert type landscape. So bare ground, no cover for prey to hide, which is the white color. Now, if you look inside that circle that I've highlighted, that peachy color is very dominant inside that area. And so our secretary birds within that region are really having to compete with all sorts of land types to be able to try and survive in that region. And they clearly are because we're still seeing them there. And much of that eastern side is linked to cattle farming. And so we're trying to work very close with those cattle farmers to make sure that their lands are being managed properly. And I'll talk to that a little bit more in a moment. Now, it's not just human related threats that are changing the landscape for our secretary birds. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the global climate crisis that we are currently facing. We're seeing much higher levels of carbon in the environment. Um, this heightened carbon has created a, an environmental condition that is excellent for bushy trees like Decostacus, the sickle bush, to start growing rapidly. Now, if you have a look at the two pictures on your screen, you'll see at the top, this is near Spionkop in Kuzinatel. In the 1950s, Spionkop was largely dominated by quite open grassland with a few scattered acacia trees. Unfortunately, if we look at the exact same space in 2015, we're now looking at a very densely wooded area. Secretary birds would no longer be able to operate in that area within the immediate foreground of that photograph. It is just too bushy for them. They need open space. And so with this heightened bush encroachment, we're starting to see secretary birds' open spaces getting squeezed even more so than what's happening with this human related changes. And one of my friends, Megan Lockie Eaton, did an amazing study looking at Kruger National Park's woody encroachment. And what she found is that if you look at the graph on the left side of the screen, she's put the percentage of woody cover per area. So if we've got zero on the left up to 100, which would be a forest, she found that when we look at these woody spaces, anything above 20% woody cover starts to eliminate secretary birds from the reporting rates on Sabbath 2. Now, this is hugely concerning. This is a very narrow window in terms of open spaces. And with the world becoming bushier and um, closed canopied, it's becoming a huge problem for our secretary birds. And if we have a look at the reporting rates from Kruger, it very much echoes the sentiment. So all that yellow and red, we're seeing decreased sightings of our birds. Now, back in the 80s, Alan Kemp did a very thorough study and he estimated that we were looking at around 250 secretary birds in Kruger Park. If we were to redo that population estimate currently, I would guess that we probably are not seeing more than around 40 to 50 individuals in the park, just based on the reporting rates that we've been getting. But it is something that needs to be done. We need to get a handle on how many birds are still in Kruger, as it is one of our flagship areas. And as I said earlier, across the board, we are seeing these declining trends. Now, nationally, we know that we're looking at around a 70% or more decline. In Swaziland, they are reporting up to an 80% decline. And the most recent study, which was done by Becky Garbus, has actually showed that Botswana is looking at around a 78% decline in their secretary birds. So across Southern Africa, we are seeing these drastic declines in our secretary birds, and it is very, very concerning for us. Luckily, back in 2011, when the, um, my colleagues Ernst Rattif and Dr. Hanaline Smith-Robinson realized that secretary birds were starting to um, raise a few red flags on the conservation space, 
they got together and decided that we needed to do something. Now, with every good conservation project, you need to start at the beginning and try and figure out where the gaps are that need to be researched so that we can start to create some good strategies to try and help these birds. They started looking at the population demography of the secretary bird and they realized that we have some pretty good data in terms of where the nests are, how many chicks are hatching, but we really didn't know what was happening to those chicks. When they leave the nest, where are they going? Are they surviving? And how many of them are actually starting to make it into the breeding population? So there were quite a lot of questions around just the basic life cycle of these birds beyond when they are hatched on the nest. And so luckily for them, with the development of technology, they could start to try and answer some of these questions. Now, before we get into the development of technology, I'd like to share with you a uh, development of the secretary bird. So you can see these birds are able to lay up to three chalky white eggs. Um, these little guys hatch up into alien looking things for the first three weeks of their life. But by six weeks, they're really starting to resemble their adults with a nice coating of feathers. And of course, by eight weeks, they are starting to develop some real feisty personalities and they're not always so happy to see us when we get to the nests. But this is the age that we like to fit tracking devices to them. Their bone structure is well developed and we can fit the tracking devices without too many hassles and it really is a good, um, a good time in terms of their development to fit those tracking devices to them. And of course by six months they very much resemble an adult secretary bird. You can see a bit more brown and speckling on their bodies. Once they become adults they will go that pure grey that we all know and love. But our question was, first six months, what is happening to them? Where are these birds going? Now, before we started the study at BirdLife South Africa, the only information we had with regard to dispersal of secretary birds was a few historical ringing records. Now, you'll see a long red stripe going across the top of the map there. That was a bird that Rob Simmons rung on Sabi Sands. And within four months, just shy of four months, they recovered that bird after having done over 1,500 kilometers. So that really is a mega distance for a young bird to do. And um, some of the other ring recoveries weren't as epic, but nevertheless, around 250 and 340 kilometers. And then we had a bird who, in just shy of six months, only did 42 kilometers. So quite a bit of diversity, but with only four birds, it really didn't tell us what these birds were up to on the fine scale and how they were moving around the, the environment. Now, lucky for us, technology has come a long way. A couple of companies have developed these wonderful little tracking devices, which we can attach to the birds like a backpack. That little dark square on top is a solar panel, so that allows the battery to keep going for a long period of time. And we use a little harness to attach um, just under the bird's wings and across their chest. And they get that snugly fit. We ensure that it's well centered so it doesn't affect any of their um, flight or movement. And then we sit back and watch what happens. And we really start to learn a lot about how these birds are developing both on their nests and also beyond their nests. Now, before I get into some of our results, I'm going to share with you some of the aims that we had for this tracking study. We wanted to know about the space use that these fledglings were using around their nests. So, how much space around a nest would you ideally need to protect if you wanted to keep those juveniles safe? We also wanted to know how long does it take these juveniles to start moving away from their nest? At what point do they disperse? And when they disperse, how far are they going? The last thing we wanted to look at was, is the protected area network actually providing these birds with a safe and suitable habitat um, across the country? And we got some really interesting results speaking to all of these questions. So in terms of where we went, uh, we had eight nest sites. We had two nest sites where we tracked two birds, um, Archer and Strider, which you can see down in Calfinia in the Northern Cape on the left side of your screen. They were two siblings. Archer was the older of the two, um, a male, and Strider, his sister, was the middle chick. And um, they also had a younger sibling, but we didn't end up putting a tracking device on that third bird, unfortunately. But other than those two birds in the succulent Peru biome, the majority of our other birds were found in that grassland biome. Petra was sort of on the border of the Nama Peru and the grasslands. We had Spaker, Lucky, Kizuna, who was in Buckerstrom, and then you'll see Taimane and Koki um, in Warden in the Free State. These two birds were tracked a year apart, but on the same nest. 
So we're assuming that they had the same parents, but we obviously weren't able to fit their parents with any identification tags. So that is an assumption. But being on the same nest, we think it is likely that they could have shared parents. And then we had our two savannah birds. Some of you may know Bling, anyone who's listening from BirdLife Northern Kaoteng, that was the bird that they sponsored. Um, Bling was uh, quite a popular media bird. He traveled all the way up to the Lakhari Khari Pans in Botswana. And then we had Artemis, who was tracked on Leufontaine Nature Reserve. Okay, so in terms of our, our timing of breeding, if you read Roberts, they say that they can breed any time of year. But throughout our study, we had eggs laid from August through to February. Um, really through that summer season, obviously these birds are taking advantage of the insects coming out and they need to be able to feed their chicks. So by tracking the rainfall and laying after the rains or with the rains, they have a much better chance of doing that. So off we go, Ernst did the majority of the birds that I'm gonna to talk to you about today. You can see him fitting on the harness there. That was Bling in fact. Um, this is a crew from 5050 um, documenting Ernst's work. And once they've got their tracking devices, we start getting data that looks something like this. Now, this was Bling's territory. What I love to point out about this picture is this was an old agricultural field that was cleared out in a savannah. And you can see the N1 highway moving through the left side of the stream there. And all around that field is quite densely wooded savannah. And if you have a look at all of those little blue dots, not a single one of them is in that savannah habitat. All of them were inside that open grassland area. So just once again, really driving home that point that these birds do not like heavily wooded areas. Now, Bling's nest site is that little white star sort of to the right hand side of the screen. What we can start to do with this kind of data is we can start looking at how far these birds are going and at what time of the day they're moving. That kind of analysis is what we call an activity pattern. And so by taking those distances and times of day, we can generate something that looks a bit like this. Now what you've got here is time of day along the x-axis, so the bottom axis, starting at 6 in the morning, running up till 8 o'clock at night. And on the left-hand axis, or the vertical axis, we've got straight line distance to the nest. So zero being at the nest, right up to 1,800 meters away from the nest. Now in the first month after fitting the tracking devices, you can see these birds are still sticking around on their nest. They're not really moving very much uh, flexing their wing muscles, starting to build a bit of muscles that they can start moving. If we look at the following month after that, they start getting a little bit more adventurous. Mm -hmm. Secretary birds are quite late risers. They don't like wet grass. They tend to only get off um, the nests around seven o'clock in the morning once the dew has started to dry off. And then you can see that they're moving around 300 meters on average away from their nest, but always coming back to where their nest is in the evening so that they can roost. If we look through month three and month four, we see very similar patterns, um, that tendency to move away um, right up to around an average of 1,600 meters away from the nest in the midday heat. And you can see towards the tail end there, that green bar showing that some of our slightly older birds are getting a bit more adventurous and tending to sleep over at a friend's house on the neighboring tree, not always returning to their own tree. So we really start learning quite a bit about how these birds are moving. Now, another analysis that we can start to do is something that we call home range analyses. Without getting too technical about it, what you see in the blue shapes, that is the outline of every single point that that bird generated around their nest, which is that black star in the middle. So what we can do with this course analysis is draw a big line around all the points and get an overall maximum area that this bird could be using. On average, we were looking at around 32 kilometers squared for this course estimate, but obviously that'll be one or two points where they've really gotten adventurous and come back in. So if we narrow this down into a slightly more fine scale assessment, we can see that they're using around 1.2 kilometers squared in terms of the area. Now this kind of analysis is very important. We work very closely with developers, particularly the renewable energy um, industry. And so they often come to us and say, if we find a secretary bird nest, what kind of buffer should we be placing around our turbines? So based on our findings, we can go to the developers and say, right, we know that these birds are moving around 1.6 um, kilometers on average. They're using about 1.2 kilometers squared. Let's go for a two kilometer buffer. Please don't put your turbines within that area. And there's a good chance that these birds will not end up chopped on one of those turbines. 
So we really have this great working relationship where we're um, working with our EIA specialists and the developers to keep our birds safe and our energy green and clean. So moving on to our next aspect, we were starting to look at how much time these birds were spending in the area. So another way of mitigating against renewable energy, for example, is to make sure that your turbines aren't swinging when the birds are present. So what we did was we looked across the different biome nests that we had and we found some really interesting tendencies. What we saw was that our grassland birds tended to stay on the nest a lot longer and a lot later than our more arid birds. Now, in chatting with some of the other ornithologists, in particular David Allen, he made a really good point. In your arid systems, when it rains, everything switches on really quickly and you have this massive period of productivity and conditions are really, really good. So lots of invertebrate activity and lots of little um, lizards and mice coming out to feed and forage. And this creates a great condition for adult secretary birds to feed up their chicks very quickly and get them off the nest so that they can move away before the conditions start to dry up and get tough again. Now your grasslands are a slightly more stable system. They still go through dry and wet periods, but on average they tend to be a lot more productive than these arid systems. So the pressure on your secretary bird parents is not as hard in terms of having to feed your chicks quickly. And they can grow those chicks up slowly and get them out of there when they oh, shit. Now, once they start to move, um, we needed to figure out how we kind of define dispersal. So these birds have left the nest. At what point do we draw the line that they have officially left home, said adios to their parents, and have moved off into the big wide world? Um, those of you who have had teenagers will know that you can't teach a teenager anything because they know everything. And our young birds seem to think the same thing, but uh, very often their inexperience catches up with them, unfortunately. So what we decided to do was to look at a distance of five kilometers and a period of 48 hours. We decided that if a bird left their natal territory and moved beyond those two limits, we could then say that they were no longer staying in their natal territory and they were off. And invar invariably, all of our birds, once they did decide to go, would do massive distances. Now, I mentioned Archer and Strider earlier. Archer was our um, long distance winner in terms of the birds that we tracked. This is them on their nest in Calfinia. We fitted the tracking devices on the 28th of October in 2013. And you'll see here Archer the male did a distance of 646 kilometers in just eight days. But if you start, that is the straight line distance. If you start to join all of those little dots, he actually ended up doing over a thousand kilometers if you do the, the sort of squiggly line between those two points. So he really, really moved in just eight days. He made it all the way into Lesotho, spent a couple of days in Lesotho, and sadly his tracker went offline. We were never able to recover Archer's body, so we don't know what happened to him. But sadly, we do think that he was unfortunately killed, but we're just not sure about what. If we have a look at his sister, Strider preferred to be more of a West Coast girl. She spent her entire life up and down the West Coast of South Africa, spending a bit of time up in the Northern Cape, um, but moving mostly around the West Coast of South Africa and eventually settling sort of halfway up our West Coast. Her dispersal distance was around 230 kilometers in three days. And yeah, she carried on for over almost 700 days with her tracking device. Um, we think that was more of a, a tracking device failure, as does happen. We don't think that she actually perished at the end of that tracking period. Now, something we wanted to look at was the sort of average dispersal of all of our birds to see if there was any kind of trend between the boys and the girls and all of these birds. And we found some interesting things. If we have a look at the females, you can see that green line. Girls tend to move away from the nests a little bit quicker than boys. Um, they tend not to go as far. So on average, they were moving around 200 kilometers away from their nest, but they would stay around 200 kilometers from their nest. They wouldn't return. The boys, on the other hand, did a slightly later dispersal, but they would go much further, on average looking at around 400, all the way up to potentially six to 700 kilometers away. And then they would eventually come back within sort of a year of leaving their nest. And they would often come quite close. One of our birds came within 35 kilometers of his own um, nest and set up his own territory there. So some really interesting dispersal patterns starting to emerge from these birds. 
Now, unfortunately, this is really the most risky period in a young sexy bird's life. When these birds start to leave their nest sites, they're inexperienced, they don't know about things like fences and power lines, and invariably they start to run into trouble. Now, the map you can see on your screen here is bling. I mentioned that habitat change is a massive problem for these birds, and what you're seeing here is the north of Pretoria. Bling, for the last part of his life, spent a lot of time moving between the pieces of felt along the N1 highway and Shoshangube Township, pieces of felt next to suburbia. Every little patch of open grass in the Bling could find, he spent time there. Sadly, he perished on a power line that had a felt fire burning beneath it at the age of two years and nine months. So despite being able to navigate this very urban landscape, it did catch up with him eventually. Now, despite having to look at all of these transformed landscapes and try and find a home, these birds are also having to now cross things like fences, and they're also starting to face competition from already established secretary birds, as well as other raptors. This tawny eagle was giving the secretary bird a bit of a rev, it had caught a snake, and the tawny was trying to steal it. So these young birds really have to be tough if they're going to survive. Now, I mentioned Bling earlier. This is what Bling's entire tracking data set looks like. You can see he started off on Sandela Nature Reserve, headed all the way up to the Mkhadikhadi Pans. His dispersal was just shy of 470 kilometers, and he did that in two weeks. He then settled just south of the Mkhadikhadi Pans, spent quite a bit of time foraging up in Botswana, and in just one day came all the way back down to southern Limpopo, eventually settling in northern Pretoria, where, as I said earlier, he unfortunately met his end on a power line. Now, this kind of cyclical movement that I spoke about earlier is something we call natal philopatry. And it's something that we observe in a lot of our raptors. So you'll see here, we've got the number of days that we track the birds on the bottom axis. And once again, that straight line distance. And we see these, all of our birds moving away from their nests initially and eventually starting to come back, some closer than others. But this really um, cyclical pattern is very evident. And it's really important that we know this because if we've got landowners who have nesting secretary birds, we need to be able to sensitize them to the fact that there will be secretary birds on their property, likely in perpetuity, because these birds like to return to the same areas. And it makes sense. If you as a bird were raised there successfully, there's a good chance that you might be able to raise your own offspring in that same area successfully too. Now, one of our probably most famous birds, because he taught us a hell of a lot about secretary birds that we didn't know, is Taimane. Now, Taimane was born or hatched on a nest in Warden in the Free State. You can see the big yellow star there. He dispersed down to KZN, and if you watch the star on the screen, this is a sort of rough estimate of where he actually went. He did a big journey all over Free State, decided he wanted to go to the coast, didn't like it too much, and ended up back just 35 kilometers from his very own nest site. He then hatched two of his very own chicks at the age of two years and nine months. This is the first time that we were ever able to record age of first breeding in a secretary bird. Now, if you think about something like a southern ground hornbill, very similar foraging type strategy, big walking bird, it takes southern ground hornbills around nine years to reach maturity where they are able to start breeding. Secretary birds are able to do it in just two years and nine months if the conditions are right. Now, what we suspect happened here, it was likely a good rainfall year, and Taimane probably found quite an experienced female to match up with. And so by doing that, he was then able to very quickly start replacing himself, which from a species recovery point of view is fantastic news if these birds are able to breed in good conditions like this. Now, we asked the question of whether our protected areas are providing safe haven for these birds. And sadly, the answer is not really. If we have a look at the green spaces on this map, those are all of our formerly protected areas. So they are legislated by law as a natural space for our biodiversity. And you can see of all of our tracking data, only 3.2% fell within some kind of protected area. And that is very concerning from a conserving the species point of view. And if we look at our mortality rates of our birds, it very much speaks to the fact that these birds are moving through non-protected areas. We saw 46% mortality under the age of three years in our tracked birds. And the majority of those, as I said, were due to linear infrastructure. 
But how does all of this information help? And a lot of what I've told you tonight has been quite negative and concerning. And I hope that by the end of this section, you will feel like there is actually a glimmer of hope because um, at Bird Life, we try and be optimistic about what we do. And we really do feel that we can make a difference for these birds. Now, what we've started doing across the grasslands of South Africa is using a mechanism called biodiversity stewardship. What we do here is we take good areas of natural habitat that fall under private land ownership. So an area like the upper Volcha area, which you can see on the screen at the moment, this is what the map looks like. Some of you who know about Angula Nature Reserve on the border of Free State and Kuzuri Natal, it's the ESCOM owned uh, pump storage scheme. Building off of that, we have started doing stewardship in the upper Milka protected environment. And we've managed to secure 30,000 hectares of extremely good grassland for our grassland birds in this region. And that's just phase one. We're hoping in phase two to continue with that, with the ultimate goal of building a bridge between the Van Rienen area, which is the bottom star, and the Miamal area at the top. That's a distance of around 60 kilometers between those two areas. And hopefully over the next decade, we can work towards building a green bridge for our biodiversity in the grasslands. So there really is some hope and promise. And working with these landowners, they are extremely passionate about the natural world. And we're very blessed to have conservation-minded landowners that are willing to work with us. Um, to conserve our natural heritage. Now, in terms of the, the take home messages from this talk, we're almost there. We know that this, these juvenile birds are able to dis disperse very quickly, vast distances, and we can't predict where they're going to go. So we need to make sure that we start to secure much bigger tracts of land and make sure that things like power lines and um, fences are mitigated and don't cause collision risk for our birds. We also know that these birds are likely to come back to the same region. So making sure that areas where we do have breeding secondary birds that are under protection is really important if we're going to see the long-term survival of these birds. And as I've just said, having landscape level conservation strategies like biodiversity stewardship or a new mechanism which is coming onto the cards, which is the other effective area-based conservation measures, or as we love to use acronyms in the conservation space, OECMs, OECMs allow landowners that are doing other activities on their properties to still reap some conservation benefit if they manage their property in a certain way that benefits biodiversity. So hopefully you watch the space, there's going to be some really exciting developments on the OECM front shortly. In terms of the actual project itself, where some of the goals we're trying to work towards over the next couple of years is making sure that we get a very good population estimate of how many birds we have left and also then generating a much stronger monitoring of where our birds are and how they're doing so that we can keep tabs on this potentially shrinking or increasing population if our conservation measures start to work. We're working very hard to start quantifying the habitat availability for these birds. And um, hopefully next year we will have the first fine scale map of available habitat for our secondary birds. And we'll also be able to dial back and see just how much habitat we've lost over the last couple of decades. And so that we can start understanding what is driving these large scale declines. And from all of this, our big goal is to make sure that we can come up with habitat management plans that we can provide our biodiversity stewardship landowners to allow them to manage those properties in a way that benefits not just our secretary birds, but grassland birds in general. And of course, as I said, mitigating collision threats is high on our agenda. We work very closely with ESCOM through the Angula Partnership and they're doing some really incredible work despite their constraints and high pressure situation, really trying to save our biodiversity um, and mitigate the impact that their power infrastructure is having on our birds. Now, for those of you who are keen to keep tabs on the project and find out what we're up to, we do have a Facebook page where you're welcome to drop us a message or ask questions about secretary birds or share your sightings. And it's just a fun space for secretary bird enthusiasts tabs with each other and find out what's going on with these birds globally. I'd also like to just put it out there one last time. Over the year, we've been um, asking people to submit any nest sightings that they may find. We are hoping to do another round of tracking in some of the areas that we haven't already worked in. So if you do happen to find a nest, at least the GPS location for us would be great. And um, if you're able to get an idea of whether the nest is active or not without disturbing the birds, 
that's also great, but um, the GPS location is really the, the golden egg for us. And this is what the map's looking like at the moment. Um, all of those white circles in the middle are thanks to Darby de Swart, and we're really grateful to him. He's been monitoring secretary birds in that Bloemfontein area for many, many years. And he really um, has been a champion for our secretary birds over the years. We've got a lot more work to do up in the north and the eastern Cape and the eastern western Cape. So please, if any of you do know of any birds, let us know. We'd be really, really grateful for your support on that front. Now, there are many people and organizations to thank, um, particularly Petra Diamonds and the Air Force Company South Africa, who have worked um, very closely with us to fund this work over the years. Um, we've had numerous volunteers, numerous landowners. I'm not going to go through all of them now, but thank you to each and every one of you who've been involved in the project over the years. Um, I wouldn't have a story to tell you tonight if it, if it weren't for all of them. And of course, my two co-authors, Ernst Ritik and Hanlene Smith-Robinson, their foresight and vision to try and conserve these birds will hopefully mean that we will not see secretary birds go extinct in South Africa anytime soon. And that is the end of my story, and I will be more than willing to take any questions. Um, I've also put up my contact details there if anyone would like to get in touch afterwards. And the recent article which we published in Ostrich showing all of these results is also at the bottom there. So thank you all very much for listening. Melissa, thank you very much. Um, I, I just was trying to get a comment. There was a comment right at the end there. Um, someone was looking for your contact details. I think they're on the screen. Um, yeah, I think it was um, uh, Peter Law. So he's just asked for your contact details. He seems to, to have a nest site and it's quite relevant because uh, I was also going to mention a nest site that I had and looking at your, your diagram on the second to last slide. Um, it's very yes. near Macala Game Reserve, which is near Kimberley, right. um, and it seemed like there wasn't a spot there. So I'll, I'll get in touch with you privately as well and, and give you the, the location for that. Um, so I think um, I, Dave and I talked about, um, you know, keeping it interactive and asking you questions as we, as we went, but I think it was so comprehensive that we really didn't have too many <laughs> things to add. So we can only thank you enormously, and um, I think... Um, you know, if we were, we, if you were presenting live with us, I think we'd definitely have a big bunch of flowers or a bottle of wine to hand over, but <laughs> I can't do that. And um, no it's, uh, it seems like our partnership with BirdLife South Africa is already uh, paying dividends. I think it was amazing to have you present to us because you, you bring a totally different perspective. It's a perspective we don't have and we can't share stuff like this. So it really, it really worked well. And, and it was the least amount of pre uh, pre preparation I've had to do for a webinar. So. <laughs> <laughs> we're doing that. Well. So, um, a huge thanks, and uh, we'll, we'll keep in touch with you. We'll we'll nudge Mark a lot to get some some more presentations from from the BirdLife staff because I think there's a ton of stuff there. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, and and maybe if you if you'll uh, forgive me for just um, talking about our next webinar, we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna be we're gonna take a break in in December. Um, we've earned it, and I'm gonna be doing some weather watching on the Crom Estuary um, in the Eastern Cape. Um, and we're going to hopefully have some rarity pictures to share with, with everybody. So um, we'll do a webinar in January, probably late Jan, and um, that's going to be our, our more advanced um, wader um, course, and it's probably going to be a couple of rarer species that, that uh, we might want to share. So um, we may be just looking at um, any, if any questions. I don't think there's we're any getting, questions. Yeah, we're getting lots of, lots of thank yous. Um, yeah, awesome, awesome presentation. Everyone's, uh, everyone seemed to... Seem to love it, and yeah, thanks, thanks so much, Melissa. It was a great, great. No story. worries. And, um, if yeah. I can do a, a plug of my own, quick, we've got beautiful little fluffy secretary birds as part of the bird of the year thing. And any yeah. of you who need Christmas presents for the grandchildren, I would highly recommend contacting our shop and uh, getting some for your grandkids. That's a great idea. I might get some for my own kids, actually. Definitely. <laughs> thanks so much, Melissa, and and we'll we'll sign off now. We'll end the meeting, and thanks to everybody for joining. We had a really nice turnout, and and I think it just shows the quality of the the the, the presentation, and I think everybody uh, enjoyed that. Thanks so much. Wonderful. Thanks so much for the opportunity, guys. It was great. Thank you, and thank cool. you everyone for listening. Cheers, Melissa. Cheers, thanks. Cheers everyone. Great people. Thanks. Bye. Cheers.